Thanks for your introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm going to pretend that I'm not jet lagged, which I actually am. Um, well, uh, what I, when I say everywhere means essentially uh, down to very simple devices, so low end devices like IoT sensor nodes. When I say continuously means always on. And when I say inexpensive, it really means low cost, including low design effort. But before, before actually uh, starting my presentation, I have to share with you, well, I come from Singapore, it's a quite warm place, but I feel that here, this, is, this place is getting hot because I'm between two fires right now. I'm between you and lunch. <laughs> and by the way, I have a third fire close to me, which is Professor Moore, which will keep timing. <laughs> so, uh, well, in this presentation, what we are going to do is, uh, we are going to talk about the context, so, uh, what are the challenges to enable ubiquitous and always on security down to IoT devices? And then we'll talk about um, three challenges that I think need to be addressed. They are quite open, uh, and that's the purpose of this talk. I'm not here to um, just show off what the, the beautiful, beautiful things that uh, my group, by the way, my students, not me, uh, do. I'm here actually to pitch a few ideas and to trigger and stimulate some discussion because I believe that there are a few things that in physical and global functions have not been addressed at all so far. And then we'll wrap up. So, uh, well, it's certainly not a mystery that uh, computers um, have uh, um, extended, uh, have expanded to different uh, scales from macro scale servers to meso, which is probably portable devices, down to a scale, which is IoT sensors. And uh, in particular, uh, we'll focus on this scale, nanoscale, so IoT. So let me just um, switch to this picture. Let me observe that typically the power uh, target, the power budget of these devices, as well as the energy availability uh, um, per day, as well as the cost and size, these are very different from all other classes of computers. So, this means that the trade-off with security is much harder to manage, and this is what I would like to highlight in the rest of the presentation. Uh, well, first, if we start uh, by observing that power is extremely limited for IoT devices, uh, I will be uh, going through this very quickly, but if you have questions, please um, uh, ask, stop me. Uh, the first thing we should observe is, let us look at the energy per bit of typical subsystems in an IoT device. Well, we have sensors, we have accelerators, we have MCUs, we have, well, accelerators for cryptography and security and so on and so forth, as well as radios. Well, one thing that is quite evident is that the cost of public key cryptography is outrageous. <laughs> it's just enormous compared to anything else. So, for example, compared to uh, accelerators for um, uh, public key, this can be from seven to nine uh, orders of magnitude larger. Uh, and four, from four to eight compared to a uh, typical task that is performed by an MCU. So this means a very simple thing. Power key cryptography is out of the picture. Okay, so now uh, we don't have a, an obvious way to deal with key exchange. What do we do? Well, we can, we can use a hardware fast, right? Uh, we can use memories, so we store uh, keys in memory, and this is well known that this is prone to a wide range of attacks. They go from software to hardware non-invasive, semi-invasive, and invasive. So that's why people came up with the idea of physical and parallel functions, because those don't store keys. They will create them on the spot, on the fly. OK. Uh, so just to uh, uh, recall a, a few concepts that were, that were uh, introduced before, and I'm actually quite thankful to the speakers. Well, the physical and parallel function is essentially, you can think of it as a circuit, Kind of digital circuit, it's actually not that. The response is digital. You apply a challenge and you get a response, which is pretty much like a, a fingerprint because it tends to be, or ideally should be, random, so unpredictable, as well as unique and repeatable, pretty much like our uh, fingerprint. In practice, those are circuits uh, with an analog behavior, and um, the circuits uh, are able to amplify random and local variations, so highlight the intrinsic difference between different transistors on the same silicon die, and discard, suppress, or at least mitigate the dependence on any other factor that is common to all these transistors. And 
Uh, this quality is translated into well-known metrics that uh, uh, evaluate, quantify the quality of the path. So here I will not really comment much. Feel free to stop me if it's needed. Um, now, many uh, paths have been uh, proposed in, in the last few years. I will just uh, show six as a few representative uh, examples. So from ring oscillators, you compare essentially the frequency of oscillation frequency of ring oscillators, and then you compare. So this, the output will be randomly one or zero, whether frequency one is larger than two or vice versa. Same with other paths, you compare delays instead. Uh, or you compare, for example, references, current and voltage references. If reference one is higher current than reference two, it means one, otherwise it's zero. Uh, similarly, butterfly, as well as metastability. So uh, you essentially use a latch to see whether uh, it tends to go one way to, or the other, and this will set essentially the, uh, the output. And then uh, what we call static mode stable, which is a new uh, um, class of paths that we proposed two years ago at ISSCC. And I will comment on this quite a bit because I will use this as a case study. So today I will uh, share with you, at least to keep you awake and to give you a good reason to wait for lunch, some uh, measurement results that we actually uh, achieved recently. And I would like to share them with you. So these are unpublished, but I think that they make a quite strong case for what I will uh, describe in a second. Okay, um, now, if you use a path in a conventional way, uh, it means uh, CRPs, child response pair. So we store these pairs in a secure database, and then uh, every time I want to authenticate a device, I will send a child and I will wait for a response. Mm -hmm. What is the problem with this approach? Well, this approach in principle is fine. The problem is that uh, when you apply to uh, an IoT device, well, IoT devices have a little problem. They have a very long lifetime. They have supposed to be. They might be embedded in objects, in buildings, right? So in that case, if you want to use uh, challenge response pairs, it means that you have to send them in plane, and it means that to avoid replay attacks, you can't repeat the same challenge response pair. Since the IoT devices have actually a long lifetime, it means you need really many CRPs. Let's just do some math to see if this is feasible. Well, I just did the math. It takes really a second. Uh, I, did, I assume let us have a transaction every hour in this IoT device. And then I will use the smallest path that uh, exists on the market, which is uh, an as run path. Okay? And then I just evaluated how many bits do I need during 20 years of lifetime. Okay. Uh, as you can see here, uh, you actually need a lot of area, silicon area. For an IoT device, this is really too much. And the cost just for the path is more than a dollar. Well, you know that IT devices are supposed to, at least in the long run, to cost a dollar everything included. I mean, antenna and so on and so forth. So this is completely impossible. And if you uh, do that even more frequently, you understand it just doesn't work. OK, so this means that uh, using uh, traditional channel response pair schemes doesn't really work well. There is a second reason why this shouldn't be used in IoT systems. Well, because actually, if you use uh, CRPs, you need a centralized trust management system. Because every time you have a transaction, somebody has to check whether the response is correct. And the, the response is stored only in the secure database. So the secure database is always between the transaction of any pair of nodes. This doesn't scale, right? Every time you have a single entity between the transaction of a large network, of course, it doesn't scale up. Um, so it's impractical. So it means paths alone are not really a good solution. They need something else. The something else is path and cryptography. Then, if, if you actually couple them, then you can do quite interesting things. Uh, in particular, I will show here with a simple example that you can actually, uh, with a path, and a crypto engine, if you put them together, you can easily uh, have a few interesting functions. The first is exchanging keys in a secure manner over an insecure channel, um, and in a distributed manner. So you can actually uh, have two nodes exchange their keys. Once they have exchanged it, the server goes out. It doesn't need to intervene every time these two nodes have to communicate. So let me show just a simple example. There are so many protocols we can think of. This is the simplest that I can. Okay. So first, you have node one that needs to be enrolled. So 
before being used deployed, it will exchange the CRPs with the server. And then node one, let's say, while deployed, wants to talk to node two. Okay, so it will generate a key, maybe it's random, you have a TRNG or, or something like that. Uh, there are uh, different uh, opportunities. It could, could be a fixed key, it doesn't matter. And then uh, you make the next request. When then the server will uh, send a challenge, and then node one will encrypt um, the key that it wants to transfer to node two to <coughs> the response associated with that challenge. Well, only this and this know about that response, nobody else. So once it's encrypted, well, this key is safe. And this gets transferred to the server. Now we can use a similar process to transfer the key to node two. And after this, you get essentially an exchange of keys over an unsecured channel. So it means that the path, with the help of a crypto engine, can actually replace completely public key uh, cryptography without much lower energy cost as we saw uh, a few slides before. So with this simple example, and there are many that we can uh, mention, many others, uh, we have managed to exchange private keys without public key cryptography, and we have enabled distributed trust because we have essentially uh, exchanged keys between two nodes. They don't need the server later on. So, and, sorry, can I yes. ask you a question? Of course. Uh, the, the communication between the node and the trusted server, how is that secure? This is not secure at all. So this relies on the fact that you have enrolled the device right. with the server in a uh, physical secure environment. Right, but what about when they're deployed and they do this key exchange and you need to talk to the server? Well, in this case, when you do the uh, exchange, mm -hmm. um, this node is, is sending, not the key, is sending the key encrypted with the response associated with the challenge that the server has sent. Oh, I see. Which so in that case, only the server knows how to decrypt that uh, message. So it can be sent on an over an unsecured channel. Does this answer your question? Yeah. Uh, and then, by the way, another side uh, benefit is that the path keys are actually never exposed over an unsecured channel. So it means that now we can use very few keys. We don't need to have as many keys as, uh, as many transactions we have, which means that we have fundamentally solved the problem of the large capacity that would be needed by uh, the traditional scheme based on CRPs. OK. Now we understand. If we use judiciously a uh, pass and crypto, we can do, uh, we can actually uh, enable certain functions that would be otherwise very expensive. Uh, the fundamental question, because I will focus mostly on the path now, is well, assuming we have a perfect path, which by the way, as Mr. Salegi mentioned before, <laughs> there is no such a thing. <laughs> and I will mention this uh, extensively in the rest of the presentation. But can we really encrypt everything? Because you know, if we use cryptography, well, we should encrypt everything. Can we afford it in very low-end devices? The answer is, fortunately, yes. Because recently, we have made quite a significant progress in terms of overall power uh, design of crypto engines. For example, let me mention what we did a year and a half ago. Uh, we demonstrated the um, uh, first AES engine that is able to run uh, deep sub macro um, and, uh, and sub uh, picojoule per bit. This is 7x uh, more energy efficient than um, the previous state of the art. What does it mean? It means that you can run at 0.1 microwatts at 100 kilobits per second, which is more than enough for most of IoT applications. Now, the question is is this good enough? Well, we have to compare with the power budget of tiny devices. Well, the tiniest I can think of is an active RFID, which whose power budget is typically one microwatt, best case two microwatts. So it means that if you want to encrypt everything, the encryption engine has to consume a power that is a small fraction of it. It means it needs to be deep sub microwatt to be feasible. And this is it. Okay. And we are also working on uh, uh, different algorithms like Simon that are intrinsically simpler as well as other circuit techniques to reduce this by another order of magnitude. So I believe that the cryptography part is already kind of solved. We can do better, but that's obvious that it's not a fundamental challenge. Now, I instead, I see three fundamental challenges in paths 
that are usually not mentioned too much, and that's what I would like to do here today. The first is cost. Okay, cost, what does it mean? Well, uh, as you might have heard from the uh, previous two speakers, if you look at paths, they are not perfect. Ideally, they should be perfectly repeatable. You ask a million times, you will have the same uh, response all the time to the, of course, when you send the same challenge. The problem is that this is not true at all. This is a state of the art of paths where we are diligently, I hope, uh, keeping track of. Uh, if you're interested, we have published in our uh, website. Uh, um, repository where you find the state of the art of us, and we are we update it every couple of months. Uh, so as you can see, actually the instability, the bitter rate is quite large. Typically, this is certainly not uh, feasible, not appropriate for um, uh, authentication. You can fail one one every two million. This is thirty percent. Let's say ten percent. You can fail uh, one every ten authentications. Uh, Typically, the target is actually one every million. Uh, real application, that's what they uh, require. And by the way, the problem is on the table, and it will stay there for a while, because if you look at the trend lines, the instability rate, the meter rate, is not going down, for a few reasons that I might comment on later. So it means that, actually, instability is a fundamental problem. OK, well, what, is, what are the practical implications of instability? First, once you have bitter rate, so some of the bits of the path key are incorrect, but you have an incorrect key. So this translates into a key error rate. As I, said, I was saying before, typically you want to have 10 to the minus 6, uh, you know, having a, uh, such a probability of having a wrong uh, key. In that case, if you consider a typical 128 or 256 bit, well, you need the uh, key, you need to correct those. And this is done typically through error correction. Correction codes. Okay, let us use the most common one, which is ECH for pass. ECH is virtually the only one that is truly used with 9 bit or 18 bits. This is approximately 7% um, instability, meter rate, which is actually very normal, as you will remember from the previous slide. Uh, this means that you need an ECC, we just implemented a couple of them. It takes several tens of kilobits. Okay, is this large or small? Well, we need to compare to the rest of the system, right? Well, here we are, uh, you know, 40, 60 kilogates. Well, you're probably implementing an IoT system where the microcontroller unit is 20 kilogates, 30 kilogates. So this path is bigger than the microcontroller is being used in. So, of course, this doesn't work. Okay? The problem with, and I'm blaming my community, uh, this is public, I guess, um, a circuit designer. We usually, you know, if you look at our, all papers, including mine, okay, you will show this is my path. It's very small, very low energy, etc. And we don't show the ECC, which is 300 times bigger, okay. Um, so if you translate this into a real design target, you typically need, if you want this to be in the order of kilogates, then this becomes, let's say, an order of magnitude lower, smaller than the microcontroller. Then it makes sense, right? If you do that, um, you need to go to deep sub 1% um, negative instability, like on 1 or 2 percent. And there is no such a path today. Okay? We are working towards the goal, but we are not there yet. And for this reason, we use many different uh, approaches to actually improve the stability of paths. Uh, well, the first is, and, and all those methods are actually very expensive in terms of silicon area, which means cost, as well as energy or, or power. The first is, well, when you design the path, well, it has to work within those specifications, assuring that key error rate. This means that you have to margin for the worst case for the process variations and voltage variations and temperature variations as well as on-chip noise as well as aging. And this means usually we uh, design for the worst case of all of those simultaneously just to make sure that the path works as expected in any condition. This is actually uh, quite unlikely. Having the worst process corner, worst voltage, temperature, and so on and so forth corner is actually extremely unlikely. But that's the best way we have adopted so far to design. And I would like to question this today, OK? So this is too much margin. And then you can cross-process uh, in a fairly lightweight manner. 
the output of the path. You can do, for example, majority vote in space or, or time. And this costs time, energy, as well as area to do spatial uh, temporal majority vote. And if you go uh, to the ECC, well, ECC is even worse. Uh, if you just spend some time and you implement a couple of BCH codes for typical uh, paths, you will discover that the typical cost of area and energy to implement such ECC is towards one magnitude larger than the path itself. Let me just be a little more specific. If we have X number of bits to correct and we want to increase by one, this costs the equivalent of, depending on how you implement it, between 350 to 500 bit cells of the path itself. So it's a humongous cost. Okay? That's why I was saying it's, it's unfair actually to show the path and not the ECC. And then, uh, well, people have, have also shown that if you do hardening, essentially you put the, the chip into the oven for a while. This a while is well known to be in the order of hours. Hours means, can we afford it? Well, if it's burning, it's okay. If it's testing time, if you do the math, typically if you are testing a digital uh, system, uh, it costs probably about three cents per second. If you do the math for two hours, this is about $200. So you're, you're selling a you know, half dollar chip and you are spending $200. So it's, this is not feasible either. And there are other solutions that can even see what happens at the boot and try to limit the number of bits that are unstable. But all these uh, solutions are expensive. So it means that we have to be judicious and spend this cost you know, in, uh, in a way that is sensible for the specific path. And this is the, the point I would like to make. In particular, now I would like to show to you some of the results that I was uh, mentioning before. Um, some um, experimental results that we uh, got in our lab in the last few weeks because we really feel that uh, this is an, an unaddressed um, uh, challenge. We are forgetting that this margin, you know, if you go to mass production, is just unbearable and we want to do something about it. Okay, so we tested uh, our um, uh, paths uh, taken from this paper that we published probably three months ago. Uh, and what we uh, did was, okay, let's start from the golden key. It means we start from nominal VDD, 0.9 volts in this case, and room temperature. Okay, so we have like 0.5% uh, bit error rate. And now we move voltage, you know, 0.8, 1 volt, temperature, 85 degrees C, and so on and so forth. What you can see is that when you move to different voltage and temperature corners, the instability goes up tremendously, okay, very fast. What does it mean? Well, it means that this path, you might not be true for, the, for other paths, but the point is the same. Uh, it means that when you change V and T corner, you are, you have to margin for a huge amount of instability that will actually rarely happen in real life, okay? So, this means that the PVT design margin is very expensive. It means that in the common case, this is the error rate. Let's say process corner. If you are here, the error rate could be quite okay. But if you look at the tails in the process corner, actually this error rate can be quite high. And we are designing here today. Okay? The point I want, want to make is this. We should actually try to understand where our chip lies now. So process, which process corner I, uh, am I? which voltage corner, temperature corner, and then get rid of this margin, okay? Instead of going for the very worst case. How to do this? Well, we are engineers, we measure. We measure on chip, okay? So we uh, add runtime PDT and VR sensors. And we are working on solutions that are uh, inexpensive because that's the purpose, right? Uh, essentially, we have all these sensors that will allow us to, at runtime, uh, estimate uh, fairly accurately the margin, okay? Once we know this, well, we can do a few interesting things. The first is, if actually the bit error rate is out of the range that we, we would expect from those measurements, it means that probably somebody's tampering with voltage or temperature. So it could be a fault attack first. So it's an additional weapon that actually we, we can build up with this capability. And 
Once we measure, we can compensate. For example, in that same paper that I mentioned before, we showed um, a few months ago a way to compensate temperature variations. And there's still, this is just the beginning. There are many opportunities to, to come up with clever ideas. Um, by the way, uh, when you compensate uh, such variations because you want to reduce or eliminate this margin, well, this is a statistical problem. So what you do is first, this is the mean, and then you want to probably operate a, a number of sigmas that assure your key error rate. Let's say 10 to the minus 6, it means uh, 4, 5, 4 5, let's say, uh, sigmas after the uh, mean. OK. What happens if, instead of considering here B, B, T, noise, etc., I get rid of B and T? This is what happens. Oh, wow. This is much better. This, this is much easier to deal with, much lower error rate. And if you want to have a sense of how much uh, we save in terms of ECC, the original one required, let's say, 20 kilogates. And then, after getting rid of B and T, uh, which we have not done on chip, we have done this post processing, okay? But we are working on how to embed this into uh, us. Uh, then becomes, this becomes five times smaller. This becomes kilogates. Then it's acceptable, okay? Uh, by the way, uh, uh, in this way, if we have a good understanding of what contributions are most important, in this case it's not noise, it's temperature, PBT, right? Well, this um, approach where we actually try to understand what the main contributions are in terms of uh, BR margin, well, it's quite uh, important to apply not only in terms of methodology, but also in terms of subsystem design. So instead of designing the path by itself, and then we do some post-processing to fix it in some way, so we'll use as much as possible, you know, and, you know uh, actually as little as possible to fix the worst case of this first block, and then the ECC will do the same we can actually optimize them with a target. The target is the beta error rate, right? The worst case. But in this case, you know the margin because you have the sensors on chip, right? And second, you can optimize them instead of building up on the worst case of the worst case. So uh, in this case, uh, here I'm showing the breakdown of the, the beta error rate uh, margin, and it's clearly dominated by temperature. So here, the trade-off would be add the temperature sensor and then a comp temperature compensation, and then uh, you're spending area and energy, but you're saving a lot in terms of ECC, two orders of magnitude. Okay, and then you can uh, actually think in a broader manner, because once you have an understanding of the margin, so margin quantification at runtime, you also know what not to do. For example, you remember I told you that here the noise contribution is not that big. So certain techniques that actually aim to uh, reduce the um, instability due to noise, for example, temporal majority vote. Well, you can do the same bit cell, you will access it you know, nine times, not ten, you want to do majority. So nine times, and then out of nine, you will take the majority of the outputs of that bit cell. Okay? This makes, of course, the bit cell more robust, more resilient. Well, but we discovered that in this specific path, actually, Noise is uh, you know, not a priority, it's not really that important. So we already know which techniques we should not use in this path. And that's what, uh, this is what I mean when I say that they should be optimized. We need to understand the most important contributions and then spend wisely the resources that we have to spend across the stages of the subsystems that I showed before. Uh, and we can make similar considerations on all the stages on, of chip life cycle. So design time, testing time, and loop time. In particular, we want to optimize the three of them so that we will actually spend available resources in the best possible manner, right? So we will not do temporal majority vote. We will do ten, uh, temperature compensation, for example. Uh, and then, uh, actually having this capability and having sensors that are on chip can be used to solve another fundamental issue that people will not tell you about, which is testing time. Testing time in IoT devices can be very few seconds. You can't afford more than that. But if you have to start doing uh, you know, validation at voltage X, voltage Y, temperature X, temperature Y, and you have to do all the possible combinations, this is totally 
unfeasible in IoT devices. So by having on-chip sensors that actually will tell you about the instability, so you have P sensors, D sensors, T sensors, then you can actually do the job on-chip. You don't need testing time. And then uh, ultimately that's the goal, and this is what we are working on, is to introduce runtime instability and margin sensing. So you want to even have a, an idea of the instantaneous instability. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so when we have the sensors inside the chip, let's say, and any kind of uh, sensors inside, inside sensors, and then you need to test those sensors, do you have any experience with that? With their sensing and the aging aspect? Okay. Right? Because you have now a micro sensing in a bigger sensor. Exactly. So this is what we call in situ sensors. Um, well, this really depends on the circuit techniques that, uh, that you use. Typically what we have seen, and we have done a lot of aging um, testing, is you want to operate pretty much in the sub-threshold region, whatever method you use, even with your path. Because then EGS becomes small, and it means that um, most of the aging phenomena will be decreasing essentially exponentially with the voltage. So now aging doesn't matter much. Okay. For example, we have uh, the, the path that uh, I was showing before. We did accelerated testing in about seven hours of plus 10 percent voltage and 125 degree uh, temperature. You can uh, emulate an equivalent you can uh, centigrade. Hmm? Centigrade. Yeah. Um, you you can emulate. Hmm? Oh yeah. Right. Right. This is assumption, right? You must make assumption. <laughs> so. Um, uh, what we have seen is that uh, with about seven hours you can em emulate what happens in 10 years of real lifetime. And we have seen, uh, since those paths actually work in sub-threshold, you have a change in instability which is probably 0.1%. It's my facts. Okay, so what you want to do is to actually uh, follow an across stages and an approach where you think of it as a system, not really uh, as different, completely different blocks. This will avoid over design, so over margining. And then uh, you can assign a cost to each of those. So for every decision, shall I do temporal majority vote? Shall I do um, uh, temperature compensation? Each of those has a cost in terms of area and energy, right? And then this boils down to a simple optimization problem. I have a system, I have a model of area and energy and the error rate, and then I optimize. I want to hit a certain error rate target with the minimum cost. And this cost depends on the application. If power is the, the main thing, I will work on power. Uh, or I will work on area if the silicon cost is the major uh, issue. So it's a framework that we are working on. And what I want to do today is just to trigger some thinking, because we can keep margining paths. It's not going to work. OK, uh, then lowering the design effort. Well, uh, recently we have been working on a concept that allows to design a path in a day. Okay? Typically, if you design it in an analog manner, which is uh, all the paths that I'm aware of, at least in ASICs, well then uh, this requires typically months of work. But if you can design it through a digital design flow and describe your path with Verilog, well it takes a day. Okay? It's a few tenths uh, of light of volume. So this is what we have done. We have shown uh, that it's actually possible. You can design in a st standard cell-based um, uh, design flow. How to do this? Well, there are three challenges that we really need to address, and we try to do that. And there are certainly better ways to do it. The first is, well, the mid-cell that we use, well, you should be able to route it uh, without affecting the behavior of the mid-cell, right? Because if the mid-cell is actually sensitive to the routing, then you cannot assure a certain error rate. OK. What you want to do is essentially to base your bit cell on a static principle. It will not be affected by the transient. Because that's the problem. If you have a delay-based or a ring oscillator-based uh, path, this is what, what is going to happen. The nearby wires, so these are the nearby wires, and this is your wire, your output right, of your path. Well, this will be actually capacitively coupled which means that depending on their activity, this will affect this voltage, which means that the routing matters 
it has an impact on the output. We don't want that. Okay. Third principle, if, if this is a DC value, no problem. Second, well, sometimes you might have noise, even soft errors, and uh, your path bit cell might flip. If it's a memory and base path, it will not flip back. It will stay where it is, right? Instead, what we would like to have is a monostable path, a path that goes back to the initial state if this happens. And the third condition that need, needs to be fulfilled to uh, enable automated uh, design flows for paths is the bit cell has to be uh, quite uh, robust against the uh, neighbors, you know, the neighboring layout environment. So you essentially you want to place it anywhere, and its behavior should be independent of what cells are being placed around it. Okay, and this is what we have shown in, in this paper. Uh, we came up with a bit cell that has all those properties, and it means that you can decide in a day. So I think that this is uh, uh, an important uh, field of research because it allows first drastic reduction in the design effort. Often day, this is the add, you know, the punch line. And then it allows something that is even more interesting, which is instead of having it separate from the microcontroller where you're using it, you can actually embed it into it. What does it mean? It means that now you have inherent obfuscation. You don't know where the path is. So this makes actually hardware attacks much harder. And by the way, um, we show that in many respects, this path is, is best in class. We are actually not giving up anything by allowing this um, capability. Third, I would like to mention uh, some work that we have done recently, and something that uh, I think needs to be explored, be explored um, more thoroughly. And this is the concept of energy security scalability. We have a rule of trust, and usually we have a fixed uh, level of security. Let's say a key size. So when you, we are using 256, well, but actually, the level of security depends on the application and the task at hand, right? So sometimes if I'm sending a temperature, not an image, maybe it's not that sensitive. I can use 64 bits instead of 256. So it's actually important, this is the architecture we explored, and this is our application, where actually the key size, which is memory map, so the architecture is actually very simple. Uh, affects the path, so it will deliver a certain number of bits, 64, or 128, 192, or 256. And the same happens into the ECC, because you can make it cheaper, right? If you are transmitting 64 bits, well, then you can actually uh, reduce the power of the ECC. And this also has an impact on the wireless transmission, at least in the protocol that we came up with. In this protocol, we essentially append a MAC which is whose length is equal to the key size. So if we use 64 bits instead of 256, we are saving wireless power as well. Okay. And overall, the uh, benefits that we found in uh, these are simulations on a Mika 2 mock platform uh, is in the order of 2x. And the design effort is really minimal. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, because you know the third fire is looking at me. Um, uh, takeaways. Forget anything else. Can you do this? Because we are going to uh, go for lunch, so you'll forget everything, uh, anything uh, anyway. But these are the things that you should really retain from this chat. First, if we want to uh, achieve ubiquitous, always on security, well, we need to use paths and cryptography together, coupled together. Uh, because now cryptography actually is quite affordable, even in very low-end devices. Then we talked about three challenges that I see as very fundamental for the development of paths and to turn them into a mainstream approach in the industry. Uh, the first is designing paths with less margin or hopefully with no margin through cost-aware design methodologies. The second is reduce the path design from month to a day because actually design effort means essentially profitability for companies that deliver IoT devices. And the, the third is energy security scalability. So the common thread between this, among these three um, directions can be summarized in a single sentence. Well, these two are essentially uh, solutions that are across level, so you don't treat, you don't design a single subsystem. You actually design it as a system in a holistic manner and adaptive. 
because you need sensors and compensation. Uh, and then you need design automation to reduce the design costs. Uh, last but not least, these are the guys who do the real work, so I would like to thank them. Um, and um, I might, you might want to look into a few of the initiatives and special issues that we have worked on recently. This is the thickest one you will find from last year, um, quite a few papers on security. And you might be interested in uh, staying tuned uh, in another special issue that I'm leading uh, for next August. And here we'll, you, know, you will find papers that talk about the energy security um, scale. And a book. This is good for your nights, if you sleep less nights. If you can sleep, this is good. <laughs> this is the first uh, book that, uh, on chip design for IoT. Uh, and I would like to mention very briefly uh, our team. So we started um, uh, an initiative in Singapore uh, because we think that uh, hardware security is very strategic and a very important uh, topic for science as well as applications at the same time. So we have put together a um, significant team uh, we are starting that soon, and by the way, some of them you might actually know. So the third player is looking at me, but it's also in the slide. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Well, they're looking pretty hungry, but I think yeah. they might, might, we might send in a couple of questions. So, uh, mine is not a question. Thanks for my presentation. Was mine is not a question, but a comment. So, uh, sure. You mentioned that public key is not a I say, not, not, it's not a good example. I say there are efficient <laughs> code-based public key cloud operators. That's the second thing. Mm -hmm. The third thing is that I also believe that half cannot be created with public key crypto quite well because I'm sorry? if you half mm -hmm. can create with public key crypto quite well because, as if I may give you an example, so if you use, for example, half generated key as a kind of private key or ECDS, they use that generated public keys, and that way you can also call some number of key exchange problems. So, and also, lastly, I would like to mention that I personally use crypto modules in the FS crypto functionality and microcontroller units, and they are, well, according to the manufacturer, they are already less than a dollar at some maybe 56 cents. So, there are this kind of advanced, well, advanced crypto modules with a Okay. Yeah. So let me reply. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm sure I will miss some of them. You will remind me which one, what I'm skipping. So the first one, well, you can get down. I, I will. RSA is probably as bad as it gets. But if you, uh, if you go to. Before you come to Miller test halfway, but uh, whenever you have to do modular uh, exponentiation, well, you, know, you can say probably in order of magnitude, you're not going to say seven or eight orders of magnitude. So any solution that uh, we are aware of is still all of them uh, more expensive than others. I'm not arguing about those things. What I'm saying is that how the key crypto is still an option for IoT, consumer IT device. That was one point. I would because say... Because they will actually... Okay. This is not the way that sounds like a good debate for the lunch. Okay, <laughs> this is a good debate. I would say that you are probably right for high-end IoT devices, and I think it's not for low-end. It's also for microcontroller. I would be happy to discuss more. And the last question uh, that was uh, that was the last question you were asking. I didn't have any questions. Uh, <laughs> That's probably enough. Yeah. Okay, I'll take it offline. Hi, Asmo. Uh, you correctly pointed out that there is no essence in mentioning in discussing with on halves without mentioning the accompanying cost of PCC. In the same sense, could you give us an estimation of the extra cost? from deploying your sensors in, in the approach that you display? Yes, well, uh, we are working on it. So uh, at this point, I can tell you uh, about simulation results. Being a chip designer, I don't believe those, OK? So I'm just sharing whatever we see on, on the simulator. We hope that, uh, with, that silicon will agree with it. When this happens, I will, I will tell you this is true. Um, what we are seeing is that you pay typically a 1.5x cost to have in situ monitoring on stability, which means your bit cell will be 50% larger. But this reduces the, uh, the bit rate from, let's say, 5% to less than 1%. As I was telling you before, every bit that you need to compensate costs 350 to 500 more bit cells in terms of area and energy. 
So even if you are spending 50% more on a single bit cell, you're still, still saving a lot due to the massive uh, in latency. This is 50% compared to the half? Uh, the original half, half, yes. And if you could make a theoretical projection, let's say, I mean, could you make a projection for how many years would it take to reach this nice supremacy if we would solve the, the problem with just error correction coding? Uh, we have a few years with this project. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, sorry, no, it's too late because of this question. Lunch. So, uh, I want to go back to your question. I think what we keep in terms of is own problem, you know that, in infrastructure and all other things. But I also think that in fact, practical sense, the solution that you uh, said at the beginning, which is actually a, a basic or clever solution, uh, did not always work in, in practice because people don't want to have a central end that is uh, that have all the power over the challenge and responsibility, not over, uh, over the keys like uh, like the Kerberos. So that is what I think is, is, is a big hurdle for, for commercialization of, of uh, parts in, in those systems. That is only my personal view. Uh, so I agree. We don't want the key. We're not going to make anything. And, uh, and well, some place, this depends on the level of the yeah, network that you're working on. Right? You, you are going for, for very small things, but if you see that even... I'm not saying it will disappear. I'm yeah. saying that the very low end, the small ones, I don't think this will happen. We will certainly need it, probably up, you know, in the level up, or in nodes that are can afford more. Uh, I just want to say that the Crystal Forest group in, in Morocco many years ago, they, they did a SSL stack of very, very, very small centers, even smaller than typical core SSL stack. So it is possible to do that, but that's also another kind of research to compress those things. But it's, it's, it's a trigger. I'm not criticizing the thing is a trigger. Uh, probably if you compare to commercial, uh, it can be true. But if you compare to what it should be in the next four to five years, where systems will be essentially shrunk to single chip, and their power budget will, you know, you will not yeah. rely on double A budgets. I, I, I absolutely sign, at least to, to my experience, what you said is very good uh, against uh, crypto engines. All right. Not be mm -hmm. personally that this will be with a pot. I'm sure it will be a crypto engine, but not with pot. <laughs> 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 Another debate about lunch. Thank you very much.